Hello. Um, thank you for the invitation, Anthony. Welcome, all of you. Um, I have a question in the beginning, and uh, I would like to know who of you in the room would consider him or herself as a hitchhiker? Would you raise your arm? Mm -hmm. Right, so. So, for those who, who are hitchhikers, um, think about did hitchhiking change anything in your life? Did it change you or anything around you? So, this is how hitchhiking changed my <laughs> physical appearance after two years on the road. You see, before I was like this, and afterwards I became like this. Um, and I want to talk with you about, um, also today, about how it changed me mentally. Um, as Anthony said, I was on a 22-month long trip around the world. So uh, this is basically the route I did. Um, I started hitchhiking in Leipzig. And uh, I went to Gibraltar and I took sailing boats across the Atlantic. Um, then afterwards I went from Venezuela to the most southern tip of South America. And from there to the most northern point of North America with a little detour to New York. <laughs> So originally my plan was just to visit a friend um, by the time when I started my trip and he was living uh, here in Uruguay near Buenos Aires. So I didn't plan to do that tour, it just happened when I arrived there. I, was, I just told him, hey, I'm coming to visit you and I'm going to hitchhike for sure across the ocean. So I did that and then I decided to do that trip. Originally my plan was to do a full circumnavigation with only hitchhiking. Um, by the time when I came to Alaska, um, I decided to stop there because I was very exhausted. It took me already like 14 months to do that tour. And I decided to take a plane which was kind of a, I don't know, a failure for myself um, to Japan and then later to China. And then I hitchhiked back from China home. So um, something when I'm hitchhiking or when I did this trip, um, I'm hitchhiking, uh, we have a hitchhiking uniform, um, we have a hitchhiking club in Germany, and when we go racing, we used to use those kind of uniforms, which is a tailor-made uniform from Russia. Um, and so the thing about the uniform is it, it's just about appearance, but also um, we hitchhike a lot in the nighttime. So um, during the night, it's about visibility. I use special like reflectors for my legs. And um, it's not that the suit is warm, it's not that it's protecting me against rain. It's like, in that case, it's totally useless. It's just about visibility. That someone sees like a whole figure of a person. Not only like two legs and bright trousers or like a bright t-shirt. And especially if you are checking the night, this is very important. And this is how I did the whole trip. And this suit became kind of my second skin. I was wearing it when I was sleeping, I was wearing it when I was eating, when I was hitchhiking, even in the shower, which is a great thing about the suit because you can just take a shower in the suit, you soak yourself in the suit, and you take the suit off and you soak your body. And it's like brand new, like washed. And when you're on the road, it's pretty important to be efficient, for me at least. And um, so the suit helps a lot in that case. And you go out in 15 minutes, it's dry, it's perfect. So uh, what I also do, like, um, I was logging my whole hitchhiking. So in total, this 22 months was like 110,000 kilometers that I did. And um, I usually, like, I had a logbook. I, I filled, like, two logbooks. And here you can see, this was when I arrived in Venezuela, like, at, at 1756 in uh, this town called Guria. And so my logging is basically that I log the time when I get the ride. It's what I got immediately got the ride, because I know the guy um, before on the boat. So I got a ride with the ship rolling and we drove like uh, four hours to Calupano and um, then so on. I, I note everything in the book um, when I'm on the road, when I do hitchhiking, not in between. But so I have like a full log of my whole trip, which is pretty nice because for me, if I read the log, it's kind of reading my own story because I know, oh, I was standing at this position, oh, this happened there. And it's a really, really nice um, um, thing to remember. So um, this lecture is about long distance hitchhiking. But what is long distance hitchhiking? So for me, I'm not claiming that with the overall definition, but for me, a long distance hitchhiking trip means that I hitchhike a tour of at least 3,500 kilometers. I don't stop in between, I just have one objective, which is my destination, where I want to go. 
And I try to move as fast as possible. Some people say, yeah, you can check where you want to go fast. I say, yeah, it's just fun to go fast. Yeah. So I want to do that. And also, whenever I'm out of the car, I'm hitchhiking. So most of the time, I'm not sleeping. I only eat when I have to. And um, I did a couple of those long distance trips on, on my tour. And so this was my very first tour that I did. I, this is when I arrived in Venezuela, and I went down all the way to Uruguay. It took me around two weeks. It's a distance of 7,000 kilometers. And so when I came to Venezuela, and um, we can go back. So you see here, I, I arrived here at, at five. And then I came to this town, Tarupano, which is like a pirate city at the, um, at the seaside. And it's a really fucked up town. I was in Venezuela at the beginning of 2015, and I don't know if you heard, it's like now a really tough situation in the country. And by there, it was already beginning. So Tarupano was really, I would say, shithole. Um, and you see, I, I arrived there at 10.25, and my first ride, or when I was at the autopista at the, at the highway, was like three hours later. So what basically happened, I arrived there, I didn't have a map, so I was like, fuck, I'm going to hitchhike 7,000 kilometers, I don't have a map. So I went to an internet cafe, and I printed out the sheets, and then the people in Minnesota didn't really understand why I wanted to hitchhike. So the first ride that I had, they picked me up, and I was trying to get out of the city, and they straight drove me back to the train station because they said, You're, you can't hitchhike. And so it was like difficult the first night and also the second night I went down somewhere here and my last ride dropped me at an army checkpoint and the army was like, it's getting dark and I was like, I want to hitchhike. And they were like, no, no, you sit down here. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I had to wait um, for two hours, I guess, and then uh, they stopped the bus and put me in the bus. <laughs> going all the way down to Brazil. Um, so what, what's a bit special about this road is like this part is the Amazon area, um, where you uh, have like a kind of road. This is the better part. You have like some asphalt road, and then you have like just parts which are not road. Um, but the more you progress, the more um, it gets like this. So this is a stretch of uh, 1,500 kilometers that I had in between. I was really looking forward to that because when I hitchhike, I always like want to go on a road that is a bit special or it's a bit exciting. And this Trans-Amazonian Highway has a huge history, mostly for tra trafficking, um, and that the road is getting flushed away once in a year by by the rain. Um, and I really thought like this is a road that is challenging me and it's going to be tough. So. Um, this ride I got, um, it's like in the back of a truck, and I like rides in the back of a truck because you can see everything, it's a really comfortable situation. I could sit down, I had this motorcycle beside me. So um, the road is usually like a dirt road, as you can see, and as long as it's dry, it's okay. But the problem is, uh, when it's starting to rain, the dirt road turns into a mud road, which means that uh, the people just can't go on. And here you can see like the trucks coming down from this hill and then they stop here because on the other side there's another hill. And um, of course some people try to get up there, but they might succeed or not. Um, and uh, what also happens is like um, the cars try to go up and the people all stand there and watch the car for 10 minutes. The car is trying and at one point they say, okay, and then like 20 people go and they push the car up the hill. <laughs> and I had to do that like three times with my own ride. Um, I was there like for six hours, and I have two friends uh, who were sailing with me across the Atlantic from France, and they had like two fully packed bicycles, and they were hitchhiking the all the same route that I did, but with two fully packed bicycles, and um, they went this track on, uh, with a truck, and they said the truck stopped, and they had like three days full stop, like for three days they couldn't go. But they said it was a nice time because there were a bunch of truckers and they started to go fishing and having barbecue <laughs> and it was a nice time. So um, this was the, the truck that I was on and you see there is no nothing you, you can like sit here uh, or you have to stand. And um, so what happened, the mud came, it was really exhausting to push the, all the time the truck. But then at one point it became pretty dry and when it's getting dry it's getting dusty. And when it's getting dusty, you look like this at the end. 
And this was actually a, a moment where I took a shower with me and then with me and the steward. And I was perfectly clean uh, 15 minutes later. And on this ride we also took like two ladies from the side of the road and they were looking the same like me. <laughs> um, so another route that I did um, was uh, going from New York up to Alaska. Um, that was a long distance, at, uh, it's like 8,000 kilometer road. Took me like nine and a half days. So um, there I was a bit more experienced, so I could move faster, especially through through Canada. And um, yeah, so if you go a long tour, and um, it's always an up and down. And especially with this tour, I had a, I left a person in New York that I really really liked. So uh, and it was the 31st of December in 2015. And um, so when I entered the road, I was already in pretty like pretty sad, bad mood, and then I got stuck, and uh, the first night I was in my tent, and uh, that was my new year, being alone in the tent. But somehow I knew, like, I'm going now to Alaska, and this is going to be awesome, and I, I felt like it's part of the experience. And when I go, like, 10 days up here, I always have these ups and downs, and it's not always that I'm happy, it's not always that I'm sad, but it's, like, just a very tough situation. Um, so uh, this was the second day. So for this route, um, I told you it took me nine and a half days to go up here, and it took me like two days to get from here to here because it's the U.S. and the U.S. is busy. Not very good for hitchhiking. And it took me another two days to go here, so I had a really good tour here. And um, this was on the second night. And usually I, I try not to sleep if it's not necessary, or like I hitchhike in day and night. I sleep in the car, but it's not the same sleep. But here it was the second night, and uh, it was behind the U.S.-Canada border, and I found myself this little nice house. Um, and in the night, I came to the customs, and I was the only person there. So that means the Canadian border, uh, the Canadian customs take a lot of time. So it took me like two hours in the middle of the night, and then I came out, and there was no one. So I found this house, and I thought like, okay, you can sleep, and then tomorrow you go on. And that was a good decision because I entered Canada and I had a really good tour. And um, what was also special about this tour is like there was so much luck wildlife, especially up in the Yukon and um, so up here in the Yukon area, I think it's twice or three times as big as Germany and there are like 30,000 people living. So it's a really huge area and um, there is space for those animals. Like this is a moose, uh, that's actually the most dangerous animal you can find there. Uh, it's not a bear and not wolves. But it's moose, and what they do, they're like really big, I think like two meter high. Um, and what they do, they run you down and they stomp you to death. And they are really aggressive. <laughs> so I was happy that I was in the car when I met this moose. And it was quite funny because they licked the salt from the road. Um, also, I found a little porcupine. And it was so sweet. We passed by, and my driver was like, You can see my driver's here in the back. And uh, he was like, Oh, he stopped, and he turned around and he said, Look at this, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a cute animal. Um, yeah, and this is what the Yukon area looks like. And uh, I went there in January because originally what my plan was to go from Alaska to Russia in the winter time. That you only can do in the winter time because there is no way to pass when there is not ice and snow and it's really cold. And um, this year it was like a linear year, which means there is a weather phenomenon. Um, and uh, it's like it was not very cold, like let's say minus 15 down to minus 35. But usually they have like three, four meters snow, so I was it was quite easy to go up. And um, the landscape was stunning. I have never seen any place in the world that it was so spacey like the Yukon Territory. And um, here you can see this is like at the uh, close to the U.S. Alaska border, and it was like minus 35 degree, and the, your breath like instant freezes on your beard and uh, on your cap. And I stuck there like for a day, so I had to go um, in a nearby um, restaurant, gas station, until someone picked me up. And yeah, then I made my way up to Prudhoe Bay, which is like the very north tip of Alaska. And um, up there it was like four hours of daylight, and the rest of the day was nighttime. And there were only trucks going up. It's like an oil um, oil industry. So uh, the last 800 kilometer, there were only oil trucks hauling 
materials up north and bring it all back down. And um, so I made my way somehow up here, and um, there it was the most hostile place I, I've been on the whole trip. It was amazing, it was so cold, and um, I luckily was in a hotel nearby, and I tried to hitchhike my way out. So this is the main road leading out of that horse. And I could hitchhike like for one hour, and then I had to go back for one and a half hour to get up. Then I had to, could go out for one hour and I had to go back. So I did that also for one day and nobody stopped. And um, eventually some pilot gave me a leg pass for a plane, so I flew out. It's nice. Um, but this, like, I really wanted to get out there. It was, uh, it was not fun. I, I was happy that I reached that point and it was kind of like a break for my whole trip. And then I was like, okay, good, look at this. And no traffic at all. Um, yeah, and the, and the third long distance tour that I did, that I want to show you, it's the last one, um, was China. So um, I came to China and uh, I knew from here, finally, I stayed a month in Hong Kong, and then finally I can hitchhike home, and I don't, I'm not relying on any, anything difficult. I can just hitchhike on roads, not boats or any airplanes or whatever. So um, I started to go to China, this is like, and I, I, I thought like, oh, just crossing China, that would be a bit boring. So, why not hitchhike the four corners of China? So um, I did this little tour, and um, I, I had a break here. This is like a distance of 15,000 kilometers in total, and I was like two and a half weeks on the road, with a little break in the Yunnan region, which is here, um, for three days. And the Yunnan region is very interesting. If you want to go to China, um, like here, it's like a, the same culture, like the Tibetan culture, but it's not close. You can go there, and it's really nice, at the foot of the Himalayas. And um, when I entered China, I had some money with me, and I tried to spend that money, and it was like really difficult. And because people constantly invite you for food, and everything is so cheap, so I decided, well, why not just go without money? And so I, I did that whole tour like without money, and I, I entered China with 30 bucks, and then I came out with 32. And <laughs> it worked. And what I really loved about China is one thing: is the highways. This is like I imagine like Germany in the 60s or, or 50s. Like you have a really nice infrastructure. And I got to say, like this is all, I thought like, oh God, you go to China and you want to go to the really far corners and it's going to be a fucked up road. But no, they have like, they have the biggest highway network in the world and the highways are really, they are new and are perfectly made. Like here you can see this is like near Mongolia. Um, there are no, or hardly any cars. You have like big gas stations, and this is the kind of highway where you can step on and take a nice picture in the middle of the highway. <laughs> and I love it. I, it's, and the whole country is like this. And if you go like on, on a long distance hitchhiking tour, you want this perfect roads. And in China, I had them. It was fantastic. And also, I learned something in China that in China, all doors are open all the time, which meant I slept all the time. When I was sleeping, um, I was always going on the top of the gas stations or on the top of the restaurants and um, it came like a little adventure at some point because I was like, oh, after some days on the road, yeah, I could sleep now and then I just try to open doors and sometimes, you know, there's a toilet and there's a door beside and yeah, maybe I can sleep in there and you open and there's a bed, someone sleeping there watching TV and like, oh, sorry, sorry. That <laughs> happened sometimes, but I, I learned my, my way. But in China, I don't know, you, you just have to go everywhere, and uh, it was fine. So I was sleeping on the roofs. And then, of course, Chinese food um, is, for me, one of the best in the world. And since people invited me all the time, um, I, I didn't want to use any money anymore, so, so I was very happy when they invited me for food. And sometimes they invited me like for really big dinners. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this is one. <laughs> And uh, it was near Beijing, they, they picked me up and I, um, I got uh, kidnapped to this restaurant. And uh, the thing was, like, here you can see that they ordered some, some rice liquor, and I'm, I'm, I'm not drinking alcohol. And I mean, I drank that class out of politeness. But uh, yeah, the thing was, so they ordered like a whole bottle of really expensive liquor. And I'm not drinking alcohol, the driver was not drinking, so that meant like he and him, they had to drink it alone. <laughs> And they were so wasted at the end of the dinner. And they, they didn't finish before the model was like done. And um, yeah, great. 
Another thing about China and in general about the trip is like uh, police interaction. So um, here I got dropped at this tall station and I tried to hitchhike and then it takes like five minutes and they get out and they ask, oh, what are you doing here? You can't do that. And they, or they, I mean, I don't understand them, they don't understand me, but they try to care about me. Of course, they bring me food at some point. <laughs> and, but it's always like police is coming and I try to be polite, I have my uniform, and in the end, they, we take photos together. Um, or like here, it's like a, an official visit of some German person. And here, he, he gave me a ride before, and then I wanted to go out of his police car, and he was like, no, 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 come, come, come. So I, he showed me the whole police station. He showed me the <laughs> Like on the other side of this photo, there were like four people standing and taking photos. It was hilarious. <laughs> oh, like this, um, that's actually not China, but Kazakhstan. And uh, like he was full of cocaine, I guess. He was a bit hyperactive. But the thing with police interaction, I always try to not piss off the police, of course. But um, for a reason, because um, it takes always time to be with the police. And they sometimes say, you're not allowed to hitchhike, like in Venezuela. And this, are the, this is really pissing me off because I want to go and then they try to make a ride for me or find a ride for me and that's sometimes like, just um, not very efficient and I try to, to get around that as soon as possible. And sometimes it works, sometimes not. So these were like three tours that I, I did and then I thought about like what is so important or wh why I'm doing that or why it changed me. So, and I think one, one thing about this whole long distance hitchhiking for me is that I found out I'm kind of a purist in this way. Like a purist means you you try to get to the essence of things and you try not to like pollute pollute or, or alter it to I, I forgot the word, like let's say pollute what you do. You, you try to keep it as clean or pure as possible. And um, I think with this long distance hitchhiking or with the hitchhiking trip and um, with that uniform I found a way to um, to do hitchhiking in a very pure way because I'm, I'm doing hitchhiking just because I want to hitchhike. And sometimes people ask me, so why why you do this trip? Or why did you do, do, do the trip? And I was like, I want to hitchhike around the world. I don't want to do a circumnavigation. And they asked, why do you want to do a circumnavigation? And I was like, yeah, just because I want to do a circumnavigation. I mean, that's it. That, that was the reason why I went on this trip. And I didn't went to South America because I wanted to see South America, but it was kind of like, I wanted to take the southern point, and I wanted to take the northern point, and then I want to go once around. And it's like, all the point of that trip was like, doing exactly this, and it's sometimes hard to, um, to uh, for people to, to understand that. And um, I wanted to tell you something more, I just have to, you know, I did some notes in case of I, I forget things. So, um, yeah, so, and I think it's a bit like with rock climbing, you know, rock climbing is maybe one of the most useless things in the world. You just climb up a rock, so why would you do that? And I think it's great. It's like wonderful. And I think with long distance hitchhiking, it's a bit the same. You're, you just do it because of the hitchhiking, or I do it because of the hitchhiking. And um, I just, um, yeah. So uh, this is for me being a person. And a friend from Finland, for example, he told me, like in Finland, they have this little tradition that um, some people, when they're bored, they, they say, like, okay, let's take the car and go to the most northern point of Finland, which is like a thousand kilometers, and take a piss there and go back. And then they do that. It makes no sense, but they, they just do it because, oh. Um, and another thing, um, which is like, really, oh, I was like thinking why, well, what is it giving to me going on a long trip like that? And I think it's like this total focus on um, the destination or on what I do which is very important for me because it's kind of like I have this objective and then everything else I don't give a fuck anymore. And this is kind of simplifying my life a lot because I don't have to think about anything, I just know I'm going to the north to Bono Alaska. Anything else during the next two weeks or till I'm there is not important anymore. And this is something really relieving, I guess. It, it's very, like, I don't know, it makes me free in a way. And um, I, I brought this focusing um, to a level, and I want to tell another story with that, um, which is a story where I, I wasn't aware of, of what happened really, but um, it shows a lot about this focus point. So I came into a car accident um, in Canada, 
And um, so my, my driver had an epileptic seizure. Um, we bumped into the ditch, the, the car flipped over. I didn't have a security belt, so I was smashed into the windows. But I, I was in a couple of car accidents, or in a few, but uh, this one was the worst. So I was always lucky with the car accidents, but um, this one was the worst. And my driver, like, he couldn't remember anything. So when I was sitting in the uh, emergency car, um, he, he said, like, no, no, there was no hitchhiker in my car. And then, um, at some point they pushed him in, so I was sitting on this chair, and he was, uh, so he was fine, and I was also kind of fine. So they, 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 they pushed him into the car, and he was lying there for three minutes, and at some point he realized there was someone behind him. So he tried to, he couldn't, he could hardly move, so he tried to look, and then he saw me, and he was like, ah, oh, you! <laughs> sorry, man, sorry. <laughs> don't worry. So, um, yeah, this was me in the emergency car. I don't want to shock you with that picture. Actually, I was quite fine. <laughs> um, but this, you know, in this, in this situation, um, the, so the thing was, I, I had this accident. Uh, the, police, uh, the, the police was there, the emergency car was there. And then I talked to the to physician and I asked him, um, what's going on? Will you bring me to the hospital or what's going to happen? And they said, yeah, 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 we would like to bring you to the hospital. And I was like, okay, where's the hospital? And they said Kamloops. And Kamloops like, was like 40 kilometers in the other direction where I was coming from. And I was like, no, why, why would I go there? And the policeman already, already agreed to give me a ride. So I was discussing with them and I, uh, finally they, they wiped the blood out of my face and I had also some glass. Um, up here, so and and I, I got into the police car and I took this ride and I did another like uh, 400 kilometer that day after that accident, and I mean for me that was just like no I don't want to go back I feel like fine and um, I talked I told that story to someone recently and um, she said like so it's really like special because see you you just check if your basic body functions are working. And if this is fine, you, you just go on, and everything else is just, it doesn't matter. And this is what I think I mean with being so focused. And I'm, when I'm in my trip, I'm, I'm totally in, and I totally want to just go to that place. And um, even in this situation. So, um, when Antonin yesterday did that, uh, um, first presentation of this exhibition, he said two things, and uh, the first thing was that um, I was writing that down on my mobile. <laughs> um, the first thing is that um, that ah wrong here, sorry. Um, hitchhiking has no timetable, and the second thing is that hitchhikers are not good planners. And I would totally disagree with that. So when I came here yesterday, um, I came from Berlin, and I knew the exhibition would start at six, and I was here at five to six. I just got dropped out here, and I was walking here, and I was, I felt like yes, I'm on time, and then I come here and he's telling that. And this reminded me a bit of my very first longer tour that I was hitchhiking, which was from Leipzig to Denmark. It's like a 750 kilometer, and I was visiting a friend, and I told her, hey, I will be at the train station at. 8 o'clock, and quarter to 8, I was at this train station, and I was so proud of me like, that I did it, and she wasn't there, because she didn't expect me that early, or in time, and I think this very first experience of going like a longer distance, and making like kind of a timetable, that influenced me a lot in what I did later, and, and what turned out to be that trip, and um, as I said, like, uh, this, this trip, like, we all started somewhere, Okay. And I started also kind of like in this situation. And uh, when I started the trip, I, I wasn't sure that I do all that. Um, I just wanted to visit my friend. But then I kind of had a lot of time because I, I sold my apartment. I sold all my stuff. I quit my apartment. I quit my job, and I left behind my cat. I mean, really miss him. So I kind of had a lot of time during this um, visit in Uruguay to do exactly what I love. And what I would love was like from the sense of checking and that's why I kind of went around the world. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much. Um, as Anthony said, I wrote a lot of stories and um, if you want to have a look, um, my blog.
blocks warm roads to E. Warm roads is a greeting among Russian hitchhikers. So when they end the letter, they don't say kind of regards, but they say they wish you warm roads. That's why I name my blog like that. And um,